it would be to just say no. <laughs> I mean, that's the most powerful thing. Um, our God-given right is to say no. Welcome back to The Feds, insiders bringing accountability, integrity, and reform to a broken bureaucracy. I am Stephanie Weidel. The mission of our podcast is to raise public awareness about the underlying issues and problems within the federal system and to provide tools for average citizens that can then be taken into the workplace and community to further enact change. We want people to talk with each other about these issues. The federal disregard of constitutional and religious freedoms, to name one, so that they're brought into the light and so they don't continue happening. This is the beginning of accountability and reform. This is what Feds for Freedom seeks. Please like, comment, subscribe to, and share these episodes. Visit the Feds for Freedom website at fedsforfreedom.org. Welcome to the Feds, insiders bringing accountability, integrity, and reform to a broken bureaucracy. At Feds for Freedom, we value constructive dissent and healthy debate. The views and opinions shared in today's episode are those of the speaker alone and do not express the views or opinions of the U.S. government or any other employer. Today, I have the great privilege of talking with Elizabeth Soliday, who was a business agent at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Washington State at the time of the federal COVID-19 mandates. Liz became a Feds for Freedom class agent in October 2021 when she filed an Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, EEOC, Religious Discrimination Class Action Complaint, along with others at her shipyard. Today, we talk about where her EEOC complaint stands now, and we discuss her son's vaccine injury that catapulted her into the medical freedom fight and qualified her to become a leader in the battle for religious freedom. Tell me about your first son and his health issues as a child. Yeah, so my first son, um, he was born in 1997. And uh, about, I'd say at about 15 months, I did see something that caused me to question whether, um, whether something was going on with the shots that he had. And I noticed that... Um, he started spinning the wheels of cars and looking at fans and um, just acting kind of funny as a 15-month-old. Uh, and um, I also noticed a lot of gibberish in his uh, talking. And, um, you know, when he started talking. Uh, and And so I suspected something, so I kind of looked into it, and I saw that one of the shots could um, cause, like, brain swelling. So um, they had actually made a, um, it was the DTP, and they made um, that into DTAP. And they said, you know, we this one's safer, and, you know, so I... Um, I thought it was, and I was pretty naive young mom. I had him at 21, so uh, then I, I went ahead and um, just kept vaccinating my children because I didn't know any better um, that I could opt out, and they always needed it for daycare or school. And, uh, and were you working as a federal employee at the time? I was actually in the military. Um, at the time when um, my children were little, um, I I got out briefly. Um, I was in the Marines first with my older son, and then I got out for a couple of years, and I went back in the Army where I had my second son. Um, so they were in um, in school or daycare, and I thought that was a requirement until about... Um, I would say 2005 or six, and then uh, my younger son started showing um, some speech difficulty, so they told me that I had to get more shots for him to be able to continue in school and get speech therapy. So um, I went ahead and got um, the shots for him so he could get his therapy. 
Yeah. No, so that let me ended up disaster. So the your first son, Eric, um, was eventually stopped showing signs of of any kind of any kind of neurological issue. And so what did you do with him to to help stop the inflammation or whatever was going on? So I would say my older son was always kind of like uh, mild um, OCD and Asperger's a little bit. Um, very mild symptoms. I think they called it PDD, like uh, per pervasive developmental disorder. Um, but it didn't stop him from um, participating in regular school too much. Um, he was just a little bit um, had some attention problems. So I ended up, um, homeschooling him and he turned out to be really smart. <laughs> um, <laughs> he learned Japanese and, um, all kinds of things just by his own, uh, his own motivation. He learned sign language too. Well, good and, for him. Yeah, because we were all trying to help our younger son. So, uh, the sign language we kind of started, and he just kept going with it and learning. Um, but our younger and son so you, could never do it. So, and so you were starting to learn sign language to help your youngest son, Brandon. Yes, and that's where I think we um, started realizing that something was uh, that it wasn't just the mode of uh communication that we were using it was a global like brain disorder and he recently had a neuropsychological evaluation and they said he had um the lady said she uh she thought he had brain damage so um he's been real slow to learn things he's still at about a uh first to fourth grade level and how old is he now? He's 21. Okay. And when did you, when for him did you start noticing uh, the neurological differences? So I would say pretty early on. I mean, looking back, it's easier to see than at the time. But he had a lot of one-sided uh, behavior as a, uh, even a young uh, baby when he was first getting up. Uh, all his shots and I think that's um that's one way they're kind of um invisible you know the damage is kind of invisible because um all the people around you have children the same age a lot of the times and they're all having the same issues and you're all, you're all thinking it's normal right and um so this one-sided crawling and um preference just uh didn't seem to ring a red or you know uh send a red flag to me but it um started becoming other things like lo losing speech um like at a around a year old um after learning like mama and cookie and things like that just mm. didn't hear it anymore so you have been on a journey to help your son and you've had to take, of course, an alternative approach because we find this with the medical system that they, they just can't seem to, to help the, the true root of the problem. Mm -hmm. So what have you, what did you find in your journey to help your son? And he has been, I mean, according to our past conversations, yeah. he's been greatly helped. Oh, yes, for sure. So um, I started out by um, a friend of mine told me about an online group. So I was on a messaging forum and I was looking at what everybody else was doing with their children uh, with autism. We all kind of um, it kind of exploded uh, during the early um, 2000s. Um, to mid 2000s just kept growing growing with these people with autism and um, I was just kind of following along seeing what they were doing what the results were and I spent a lot of money on different kinds of supplements and I thought that I could buy his health um, to a certain extent because um, 
that that's what was kind of ingrained into me growing up is you can take a pill for something right and um so i realized that even if i had millions of dollars um i could not heal my son um and that was um really difficult for me and um it was a you know the realization that um your son is worse off than the the person that you thought was the worst off ever when you were growing up uh like helen keller um you know that's a, a hard pill to swallow um so it was really kind of a desperate situation um where I would have tried anything. So I just started, um, started asking God, you know, why is it happening to him? And I really felt like I wasn't, uh, I wasn't getting any, any answers. So I just kind of patiently waited. Um, and my husband told me, just start following your instincts when you're you know, when you're doing something with Brandon and I started doing that and I started, uh, following like my conscience and my instinct and, um, and it was really helping a lot. And we ended up doing some really alternative things that no one else was doing. Would you like to explain some of the alternatives? Sure. I can do that. Um, so some people were trying like medical marijuana and and so we were looking into that and um i told my husband that's a no you know um it just doesn't seem to be the right thing and and uh by this time i would say i probably had at least 300 hours of researching medical studies and reading all kinds of biology and chemistry and microbiology textbooks. Um, so I was pretty smart at, um, getting onto, uh, the right things to read about things. <laughs> Boy, Liz, this story is, uh, a, a lot of these federal employees have put in hundreds of hours to keep up the law. They don't. Yeah, I had started everyone looking up studies and all that. Anyway, go yeah. ahead. So I happen to be um, kind of lucky I was in college and I had access to a scholarly database. So, um, that helped me look up the, uh, medical information. So I started researching the vagus nerve and I, I realized this is, you know, this is where the problem is. You know, there's, um, you know, my son's, uh, vagus nerves not working right. And his corpus callosum, like the middle of your brain is not um communicating back and forth between the hemispheres so um i started looking into like what what can calm the vagus nerve so um we ended up with um nicotine <laughs> so uh he uh well i found a um a protocol online from a doctor um, that had tried this on kids with autism. So I felt a little more empowered to try this um, than I would have if I just found nicotine. And I was like, I don't know what dose or anything, you know. So um, this doctor had tried um, a certain really small patch. Um, and we started that around, um, I'd say Brandon was about eight or nine years old. Um, and it helped tremendously um that was one of my like instincts like this is it <laughs> and what what symptoms did it really help so um because my so son's vagus nerve didn't work he um everything was going very fast for him he couldn't relax like um everything in his body was just nervous and um like his speech wasn't clear because when he said something, it was just like, you know, very, um, almost like just really choppy. And then the same with digestion was not flowing properly. And so all that stuff started, um, 
it started helping his speech. Um, it started helping him to actually focus and learn something. Um, so his brain kind of slowed down to um, process. <laughs> and um, it helped his digestion. So he wasn't um, being so reactive to all the foods that we were giving him. Um, because at one point it seemed like he was allergic to everything. Uh, and I think his body was just um, not digesting properly. And it just kind of slowed that down, you know, get the gastrointestinal fluids to, you know, have a chance to work. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the story we hear all the time. This is what Andy Wakefield, the um, the work that he did, he drew the connection between the gastrointestinal issues and um, and autism, that, that there's a gut issue going on there. <clears throat> yeah, so... Um... So later on, we experienced a little, like during puberty, we started experiencing with him, um, well, it started off with his eyelids fluttering. So um, something was going on again with his nervous system, and we weren't sure what it was. Um, and during puberty, they say, um, well, in the autism community, the biomedical community, they say that a lot of um, detoxification occurs during puberty because, uh, you know, the kid's getting bigger and there's more uh, blood flow and um, things are coming out, like the bones are growing and stuff like that. So we believe that there was some detoxification happening um, that started causing seizures. Um so they went from like eyelid fluttering to full on um like grand mal seizures and they weren't um they weren't super frequent so he never got on like medication for them um but we did take him to the ER a couple times and uh we noticed they were triggered by uh heat like um, exposure to either hot weather um, and not drinking. He didn't have the urge to drink. Um, and also uh, by like rigorous activity. So anything that would uh, raise his adrenaline pretty much um, would make his face really red and he'd start... Um, getting too hot and overheating and have a seizure so and did anything help with that so we took him to several different places for that and they kind of just looked at me like um you know we don't have anything for this we don't know what you're talking about we can put him on seizure medications but i was like well you know this only happens like every month or two you know it's not like an everyday thing, so we don't want him to be dependent on this medication. So, again, I started researching and, you know, how do you uh, make someone sweat? Because we noticed our, um, our son was not perspiring at all. His face was just getting red, and he would actually splash water on his face, and... Um, that had happened since um, he was pretty young. And I guess we didn't notice he wasn't sweating because, you know, when you're a little kid, like um, five or six or whatever, you're, um, you're not like at puberty where you sweat a lot more. So uh, when he hit puberty and he's supposed to be sweating more, that, that's when it really affected him. And um, so... I ended up finding out that Guinness beer helped. <laughs> um, helped Would you like to tell the audience how you found that out? Um, just internet searching. I was looking for anything. I thought um, there's got to be a way that, um, you know, some kind of trigger that makes people sweat. But I couldn't find anything. And then I, I saw the thing about the Guinness beer for the horses and I thought, Am I that crazy? <laughs> and uh, I talked to my husband about it, and 
And he was like, well, why not? You know, people in France give their kids a glass of wine with meal or a, a little, little tiny cup of wine, right? And um, so I went ahead and got like a six pack of Guinness beer and I gave him like half a beer. And um, it was like the first day was, you know, we didn't notice anything. And the, the second time I gave it to him, my, my husband called me from picking him up at um, after school daycare. And he said, Brandon's sweating. <laughs> and we were both like, wow. <laughs> and so that, um, that is one thing that um, helped a lot. And, and it wasn't, um, I would say we gave him maybe four half beers um, within like a week and a half time. And then, you know, two weeks later, we gave him like um, a couple half of beers. And, you know, we're just trying to make sure this sticks. And, um, and it ended up sticking, you know, we didn't have to keep uh, giving him the beer. It was just something in it. Um, which I I thought was uh, the nitrogen maybe because Guinness has um, nitrogen, uh, which is a little different than the other beers. So, <laughs> of all funny things, right? <laughs> so how did you, how has this journey with your son uh, shaped your view of the medical system? Well, <laughs> um, it. <laughs> It definitely shaped my view to the point where I would never work for them. And I just can't. I mean, I don't think it's right to charge someone for health advice. And that's just my personal opinion. Uh, Brandon and I have, uh, <clears throat> we've totally overhauled our diets and we eat healthy. And we're pretty convinced that that's the way to go um, to health. And so it's hard uh, for me to see a different way. It's hard for me to be uh, empathetic to uh, people who don't want to change their whole lifestyle. So um, it definitely changed things for me in seeing uh, a lot of the corruption that went on too. Um, they asked my son to be in several studies but uh they weren't going to give me the results so they were going to take you know his blood or urine or stool or whatever and and test it and use it for their study but then when i asked them what would be the benefit for my son there wasn't any it was just um you know going to be a collection for them and they pay me a little money for it so, um, didn't have a great view of them after that. All right, let's fast forward to uh, 2020, and you are at the Puget Sound Navy ship Naval Shipyard in Washington State, and you, uh, what was your job there? Uh, my job was a business agent. And what did you do? So I handled the finances for about seven small projects. So um, I would talk to the engineers and I would talk to um, the project manager and I would just make sure the money's in place uh, for what they had to do on the projects. Um, our, like, um, our availabilities, I guess you would call them that. That's like a period of performance of uh, of work. Uh, were were pretty short, so people would fly out to different places and um, do different things to these boats. And that's uh, what I did. I I kind of coordinated the money for all those things to get done. So, what was? How long did it take you to realize that the given narratives with COVID were not quite right? So I, I pretty much noticed it right away. Um, 
I started just looking at nature and making sure that no one was poisoning us because when they, you know, when they say something bad's going to happen, then you kind of start wondering like, well, how do you know, you know? So, um, so then, you know, I looked at, to see the insects come out and the birds come out and, you know, there's not something in the air. And then I kind of knew everything was going to be okay. Um, we got through H1N1, just kind of um, flew under the radar and uh, ignored it, basically, and stayed healthy. And same uh, same with COVID, except we were bugged a lot more. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what did you all start seeing at the shipyard? And um, what made you need to stand up and make a really loud statement? So, um, what, what we saw was, uh, I guess it was kind of a building thing that was, that was going on. It, it seemed like the, the stress and the pressure was just, uh, building from when COVID started, you know, it, um, the rules were changing all the time and that was frustrating people. And I think, <clears throat> I think that's kind of by design to stress people out. And I think a lot of the people within a couple months in realized that uh, this is not going to be a huge thing. This is, um, they're making it more than it is. Uh, you could see in people's eyes when you walk past them in the hallways that um, they felt something was wrong with what was going on. You could just look in their eyes uh, with the mask on and um, and see the depression in people's face. Mm -hmm. So how were the unvaccinated people treated at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard? So um, I would say like after, well, before the mandate came out, I think we were just told, like, um, on the honor system, you can take your mask off if you got the shot, you know, something like that. And um, so th it was um, when the shot started becoming available, then it started getting weirder, you know. Uh, we started having the, the division of people, right? And then... And then when the mandate came out, um, we started hearing people in the office or people around um, start talking about going to get their appointment for their shot. And uh, a lot of them were very open with it. You knew what they were doing. But then uh, you wouldn't say anything. But then there was this undertone that uh, the people who didn't get it were going to be out the door and replaced uh so that started becoming very stressful um and was that just a spoken thing or was that a written statement so it went from a spoken thing i guess um or i'd say it, it went both ways kind of um at first i i think everybody was kind of up in the air whether the people with exemptions were going to be staying or not. But then when it became abundantly clear by messaging that we, <clears throat> that the intention that we were not going to stay and that we were going to be punished uh, for disobeying an order, uh, then people in our areas became pretty vocal about it and you know what was going to happen with our work and um you know that's a really uncomfortable thing when when you feel that you have this right and you uh want to stay at your job um to have people talking about your work or your job <laughs> and um so that's where i think um we start getting into how people were treated, you know, and <clears throat> there were definitely differences, um, differences in 
um, seniority, I would say, like there was a uh, reputation damage of people who weren't, were no longer going to be considered for uh, trainings or uh, promotions that they may have before because um, they felt like you made this decision. So, um, so we're thinking you're not on our side anymore. And, um, and so travel, like, uh, people were, there used to be some lists that came out that, um, they would say, uh, you know, there's travel opportunities to Japan or, um, Hawaii and would you like to go? And they used to go to everyone. Well, then, um, eventually it came to, you know, it saying on that, um, list that you have to be vaccinated or the list just started going to the certain people. <laughs> um, and then it was, uh, you know, the mask and the testing aren't, aren't good enough as, as part of that. Right. And, and that wasn't right because, um, our commander had said it's safe for us to work there with um, the protections that we had in place before the shot. So, so they changed everything after the shots became available. It's it like just became all became health hazards after the shot. And so the, there was a vision. That's just, yeah. we became health hazards. And I feel like um, some of them kind of blamed us as the reason why stuff was just dragging on so long. Um, I mean, and the, and the emails that we all got that they found annoying, they were pretty vocal about it that, um, you know, they're kind of sick of these emails coming out. And, and I think they knew there was an agenda to get so many people, uh, vaccinated. So, so they could get up to their numbers. And, and then, you know, who are they going to look at, right? <laughs> it's us. And, um, I mean, so there were, uh, several people who, uh, retired early and in my group, um, that, that just didn't want to, uh, deal with that anymore. I thought that was an easier way. I mean, people talked about moving a lot and some people moved, um, and some people were threatened to be punished and left. Um, I just chose that instead. So, so there, you all organized at a certain point and started pushing back and it was, you were kind of at the very center of that pushback. Yes. Uh, so how did that happen? So, um, I think I might've been one of the first people to put in a complaint to EEO. Um, I just felt really strongly that, um, that the president shouldn't be saying that, uh, uh, you know, we need to protect the vaccinated from the unvaccinated. I felt that was not right. <laughs> right. I mean, isn't the whole point of, of vaccination to to give you immunity which they've totally yes. changed the definition of a vaccine at this point but yeah isn't that the whole point it doesn't make sense and just for our viewers eeo is the equal employment opportunity commission that she's talking about go ahead yeah so my first complaint was against the um the president and the shipyard commander but then um the eeoc said that i couldn't um complain through them about the president so um i didn't go through other means uh to do that um for whatever reasons at the time looking into it and um so i i then I think I heard from someone I had talked about vaccines to before, and several of us just uh, came together. I don't even know how. 
um, we were on some alternative uh, message groups and um, we joined our groups and we started talking about uh, what we could do and, uh, you know, about our rights and things like that. And then uh, we had our first meeting, I think in, um, I think it was October, um, but we got together pretty early. And then October of 2021. Yes. And did you find Feds for Freedom at that time? I think I did. I think I just didn't. Um, I just didn't know much about them at the time. I think I knew that they existed, but um, I was more looking into Liberty Council because Feds for Medical Freedom was so new. And then my husband and I called tons of different attorneys and we just couldn't find anyone in Washington state that would, um, entertain our, uh, our case. And some actually told us, we hope you lose. <laughs> so, yeah. And, um, so there was, a uh, a real bad attitude, especially around this state. Um, that's. This now lawyers were telling you that? Yes. Do they know the law? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think <laughs> they let their personal feelings get in the way yeah. for sure. That's right. All right. So you started organizing yourself into an EEOC um complaint. Yes. Yes. So um several people and I all got together and um uh, Basically, I don't think we all signed the document, but they all gave me their names and said they wanted to be part of it. So I think we started with around 52 people um, on our very first informal class complaint. And then it went um, to um, basically it got it got investigated and processed. Um, well, process first as a formal complaint and then investigate it after that. Um, by the time the formal complaint came along, I think we had um, over 150 people. And that's Whoa. still probably only 12% um, only or so of the actual number of people who could be in our class. Yeah, well, but still, to that many people at one base, mm -hmm. that's good for you guys. Well, so I became almost like an, um, like an EEO counselor <laughs> because um, our, our office was not big enough to handle the, uh, the amount of people who were contacting them. And they ended up just telling me, um, you can just take names and then give them to us so so that's what i was doing i was taking down people's names and um sending uh the eeo office lists of people and um you know they were contacting me sometimes every day it was uh it got real busy um and then um then when we started uh with our Feds for Freedom attorney, uh, we realized that everyone should have put in their individual complaint. So I was never properly counseled um, as a class agent. Um, so I didn't know this. So uh, we only had a list of names and then um, all of a sudden we had to jump through all these hoops and everyone had to uh, write their individual complaint. So I was kind of helping them with um, with some generic language so uh they could write a complaint and then they could add their own personal um information to it like what um what their experiences were so why do people submit eeo complaints what is the eeoc there for so eeoc is there for equal opportunity employment uh for advancement really and um the 
they're there for other things too to make sure people aren't harassed and um uh, or experience disparate treatment because of their protected classes. Um, so there are several different protected classes and we were among the, the religious. Um, and submitting our religious exemptions shows that, um, that it's a protected activity. Did, did they say that you're a protected class? So no, they didn't. <laughs> they they kind of ignored the fact that we are a part of a protected class, and and honestly, most of us didn't know that um, submitting a religious exemption is a protected activity. Um, so it shows that you have a sincere belief um, that you're willing to, you know, do that, other than take part in whatever policy. Year. What is an example of a protected class that is recognized? So, um, disabled, like um, ADA, Americans for Disabilities Act, or um, or race or sex. Um, and so they're saying because you, they're saying that people who submitted relig religious complaints were not protected. Yes, that is how they um, ended up. Uh, and is it for that reason that they've tried to throw out almost every single EEOC class action complaint that has come through? Yes, it is. It is for that <laughs> reason that they will not uh, acknowledge that we are protected um, as a religious class. So <laughs> this is the funny thing. I used to think the EEOC was out to protect the employee. But actually, it's out to protect the employer. Yeah. It's out to protect the government in this case. Yes. And that is for sure. Should not be shocking, but it is shocking sometimes still. So where is your class action complaint right now? So it is in federal court. It's in the Ninth Circuit. And right now we are pending an appeal. So they filed a motion to dismiss. And we are going to file an appeal to that. And are you in charge of that appeal, of getting that in? No, we have attorneys. Uh, we have attorneys that are um, from Feds for Freedom. It's is Scott Lloyd and his group? Yes. So they're, they're appealing on your behalf? Yes, they are. Okay. Well, good for them. Yeah, you you all out in uh, Washington State have certainly, you I think you had one of the, I don't know if you had the biggest class action. I think Probably. you had the strongest, yeah, the strongest um, claims. Yeah, um, so good for you all for keep for keeping on going there. It's Thank really you know. tough to keep going when you're when you're shot down so many times, but you know you all are right. So. Did you ever see yourself kind of leading the charge for an entire? No, in fact, uh, in the beginning, I almost kind of backed out because I thought I'm not a good speaker and, um, you know, I can't lead this. I have too much going on with um, my son and cooking every meal for him and and it's too hard. And then and then I just kind of realized that um, that God had prepared me for this and and I thought Liz you're the one who has to take it you know you're the one who um this fell into place so uh be there and and do it and that's um been really interesting <laughs> how has your faith grown through this time well it's it's difficult leading a, a big group I mean um uh, I wasn't sure, you know, what the religions of these people who were who were in my group. And I I tried to accommodate all of them the best that I could and respect all their different beliefs and um and so that was a consideration as an empathetic person. I feel like I did really well at that. As we got closer to um filing in court. I really felt like I needed God's guidance and that um, I couldn't 
make decisions on behalf of the group um, by myself. So um, I really gave over the whole case to God and and said, you know, help me um, help me know what to do next. And I feel like God just showed Himself to me. Um, he more so than um, than talked to me or told me. I feel like He showed me who He was. And uh, one of the first times that it happened was um, we had saved up a bunch of money as a group and and we were deciding whether to um whether to go with uh feds for freedom and uh and go for it with the case in the ninth circuit uh which is not so friendly for um you know conservative uh religious people sometimes um and so i wasn't sure about that and uh, i went i went to church after not going to church very much <laughs> And uh, the story was about uh, Moses in the Red Sea and leading the Israelites. And um, and uh, it was all about um, when it seems impossible ahead, move forward. And I thought, boy, is that a direct message to me? And I thought, um, you know, he's really just showing me who he is, you know, and um, that I... I can't doubt what God's going to do with this. Um, and even if it's, I accepted that even if it's the fact that every single person in our group has been, has been touched and their faith has grown and they've become closer to God, then, um, that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing that, that we should be thankful for. Yeah, I've noticed I, I would say maybe half of our guests on this podcast have um, taken on an unpopular um, stance before COVID. Though it was true, it was unpopular and they were standing alone. And so that really prepared them to take a leadership role um, in this massive uh, upheaval in our country. And I think even more the people who took a little bit longer to come come around to all of this, the realization of what has, has truly taken place over the past couple of years, that those people are now ready to fight the next thing. And I mean, we're seeing this already that the DEI stuff, the d diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff is, is at, it is in the door of the federal community. Um, it is being placed on the federal employees right now. And some are even having, um, some are even starting to see their jobs are being, starting to be held uh, in jeopardy over their uh, agreement to affirm or not. So um, it's, it's amazing how this, uh, this is kind of coming full circle. Now you all had a sense of urgency um, at the shipyard and specifically in your family, like you had to stand up and say something. And why did you have that sense of urgency? Yeah, I did have a sense of urgency because um, my son and my husband and I all had jobs there. So um, all of our jobs were on the line and our son with the disability was, um, you know, dependent on us for support. Uh, you can't just, um, you can't just feed him anything. His diet's very expensive and we just didn't know what we were going to do. We talked about leaving the state and we even talked about leaving the country, um, until we realized this was just so widespread. It was all over the place. So. Yep. There's no way, no way around it. You have to go right through it. Yeah. It, it honestly felt like economic sanctions, um, the way like the U S government, um, deals in wartime with other countries. Um, it felt like economic sanctions on us. Um, you know, if, if we don't behave a certain way, then they're going to cut off our, our supplies. And that was, um, and our money. And that was, uh, really difficult. 
That's a very good point. Yeah. So do you still work at the shipyard? Um, I don't work at that shipyard, but I work at um, Banger. It's a submarine base uh, that's about 30 minutes away. Have you seen any kind of discrimination there? So if I if I do see discrimination, I usually call it out because I'm not uh, so afraid anymore to say something. And I try to do it in a way that I'm not... Um, Blaming the person, I just let them know that that's um, that's wrong um, to do a certain thing. So I I am trying to speak up tactfully. I know a lot of people are a lot um, are a little on edge since COVID, and they're especially on edge around me. I think if they know anything about um, who I am, so I. I try to tread lightly on that and just respect um, that that they're on edge. And I'm trying to be a professional and professionally correct people if I see something wrong. Um, there have been a couple things um, that I've written down that I would like to point out. So um, I will be doing those, and it's just how, how the command is not following certain... Um, certain things that they should be. So um, I'm holding them accountable and I really uh, do believe in that. And I think that as federal employees, um, I've seen part of our obligation is to hold people accountable by being honest in our work and and um, not showing uh, partial treatment to others. So if I see anything like that, I definitely um, I am going to point it out in the best way I see uh, possible. Um, that's a benefit to all of us. Well, Liz, I have one last question for you. If the average American citizen can do one thing to combat the corruption that we've talked about today, we've seen for the past couple of years, what would it be? It would be to just say no. <laughs> I mean, that's the most powerful thing um, our God-given right is to say no and um, and not consent. Because um, once you consent or um, if you're inactive, um, you just give the power over um, to the other party. And e even we see that during um, the EEOC or the lawsuits, it's like, um, you know, well, let's just wait until we iron this all out before we're going to, um, you know, settle with you or fix this problem. Well, you can fix it right away by just calling it out or saying no. So let's start doing that. That's, um, that's what I would suggest. That's excellent. Thank you, Liz. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us today. It's been great to have you. You're welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in. Please like, comment, subscribe to, and share our podcasts. Visit our website where you can sign up for our latest newsletters and become a member of Feds for Freedom at fedsforfreedom.org.